you know, we have a small garden of pot plants behind our house. And I love plants and I love gardening. So every morning, you know, when I pull the curtain of that window that is facing to this garden, I usually stand there for a few minutes, you know, looking into the garden, all those green plants, especially the new flowers that come every morning. You know, it really, I feel so happy and so refreshed looking at those uh, flowers and, and the green plants. And a few years back, we have planted a lemon tree in one of those big pots. And, you know, we have uh, given enough fertilizer and we were watering this lemon tree and it grew so well. So for some time, like for three, four years, I'm expecting some lemon, some fruit on this tree. Because, you know, all these lemon trees that we see in our apartment complex, trees that are smaller, even smaller than our lemon tree, they give fruit in its season. But our lemon tree was not giving fruit. It was grown and it was healthy enough to give fruit. So I was waiting. You know, I was waiting to see a lemon on my tree. And somebody told me that scoring your fruit trees, scoring, I don't know if you have heard this word, scoring your fruit trees can increase in fruit production. If you don't know what is scoring, it means making a shallow cut around the trunk or the branches of a fruit tree if it is not bearing fruit on time. So that can increase the yield, the fruit production. So I did that also. You know, three years back, I have done that shallow cut. And then that year, I saw few flowers on this tree, but no fruit. The flowers were gone and there was no fruit. Last year, again, we saw more flowers on this tree. But again, there was no fruit. So I was waiting, waiting, and waiting in expectation to see my lemon tree bear fruit. You know, finally, finally this year, I saw few lemons on this tree. And now they are half grown, but I won't be here to harvest it when it is going to be ready. So I told my son, you need to uh, pluck it and keep it in the fridge at least, you know, so when I come back, I can see these lemons. So I was waiting in expectation, you know, for some time to see my lemon tree bear fruit. Have you ever waited for anything? I know that we all wait, right? Maybe you are waiting for God to open that door. Or maybe God has given you some promise in your life and you're waiting those promises to be fulfilled, right? Maybe you are, breaking, you are waiting for a financial breakthrough. Maybe waiting for a healing or deliverance, or some miracle in your life. But waiting is not a pleasant experience, is it? Is it a pleasant experience? No. So while we wait on a daily basis for so many things, do you know that our God is also waiting for us? You may ask me why God has to wait. We know that God has all the power. You know, He is God and he can do everything that he wants to do. Why he has to wait? So why is God waiting? So to get an answer to this question, we need to study the purpose for which God has created the human beings. You know, when we go to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 30, we see God creating human beings in his image, in his likeness. And God wanted the human beings to rule over everything else that he has created. Whether it is birds in the, in the sky or fish in the ocean, all the creatures that is moving on the earth or animals, you know, all the trees, all the plants. God want, wanted the human being, the man, Adam, to rule over all these things. So he has put everything under him. In verses 29 and 30 of Genesis chapter 1, we read, that God has given everything in the hands of Adam under his authority. We know that God is the ruler and the Lord of the universe, right? So he created man. When he created man, he created him like to be a mini him. Like, like him, you know, in his image, in his likeness. And God wanted man to rule over the earth. He wanted man to be fruitful and live, in, live an abundant life. You know, by keeping a strong relationship with him. Man, uh, God did not create man independent to rule over the earth, but God wanted 
this to be done in fellowship and partnership with God. Amen. In Genesis chapter 3, when we come to chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, we see God walking in the garden. You know, every day he used to come, in the cool of the day, God used to come to the garden to fellowship with Adam and his wife Eve. So one day, we know what happened with Adam and Eve. You know, the enemy came and they fell for it. So they, find, they, they realized that, you know, they are, um, they are naked and they, have to, they cannot stand before God. And so they, they were running, they were hiding from God. But God came down, you know, every day he used to come the same like that. You know, that day also God came and he was there searching. He was calling out, I had a, where are you? I can't see you. Where are you? I'm waiting here. You know, I'm here. I'm waiting for you. Where are you? You know, God came down. He was searching and he was waiting for his creation. But it was a man who ran away from God, who, who hid himself from the Lord. So this searching, you know, God coming down, searching and waiting for mankind, it started in Genesis and it's still continuing today. And when we come to the history of Israel, you know, Israel was a chosen nation, right? They were the covenant people of God. And we know that God blessed them abundantly, just like he has promised to Abraham. And we know the history of Israel that the stubborn nation, you know, the people of Israel were so stubborn. They were unwilling. They were so disobedient. So they did not live in the blessings God provided for them. So in Isaiah, when we come to the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 1, we read like this. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord. To those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, keeping sin upon sin. See here, the covenant people, the chosen people Israel, God is calling them obstinate children. You are so stubborn. You are so disobedient. You are not listening to me. You are carrying out plans that are not mine. And you are making relationship with other people, not with me. That is not by my spirit. And thus you are doing sin. You know, when we study the history of Israel, we see God letting the enemies of Israel attack them and capture them. And in, that is what we read in the book of Isaiah chapter 30. You can read it at home. You know, when the Assyrians and Babylonians came to capture Israelites, you know, they did not depend on God, but they went down to Egypt. So that is why God said, you are not making alliance with me. You are not coming back to me. You are running away from me. You are going to Egypt. You are, you are depending on Egypt. Why can't you come back to me? But in verse 18, you know, still God is waiting patiently for his people to come back to him. We read like this. But God's not finished. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. You know, in verse 18, it says, God is waiting to show his compassion on the people. God says, I'm not finished with you, my people. Even though you have forgotten me, even though you have forgotten the covenant I made with you, I haven't forgotten you. I'm still waiting. Come back. Come back to me. I want to show you compassion. I want to bless you. In verse 19 of the same chapter, it says, how gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Do you understand the intensity of God's love? And how he longs and how he waits for his children to come back to him. He's such a compassionate God. He's so gracious. And we know that, you know, if somebody calls us, if somebody is calling us, maybe from outside the house or in the house, or by phone call, you know, if we are not expecting that call, we will not answer. We may not hear, right? But if somebody is telling us that I will be calling you at this time, or I will be coming to your house at this time, then we will be expecting a call. We will be expecting that person. So while we are waiting, you know, to see or hear that call, then as soon as the phone rings, you know, at the first ring, you will hear, you will answer, right? So here also, it, it is like that, you know, God is waiting attentively to hear you call him at the first ring. You know, when you call, God, my father, he will answer you. As soon, it, it, that is why it says, as soon as he hears, he will answer you. And in verses 20 and 21 of the same chapter, Isaiah 30, it says, your teacher will be hidden no more. 
with your own eyes you will see him when you turn right or left you will hear a voice behind you saying this is the way walk in it you know so god is saying here it's okay if you are not listening so far if you are not getting my instructions you are not listening you are not turning according to my advice it's okay but i'm here for you i'm here to help you today if you come back to me no i am here from this day forward i will help you i am your teacher i am your instructor i'm here to help you would you come back to me so how can anyone ignore such loving forgiving and compassionate god in psalms we read in psalms 145 verse 8 psalm 103 verse 8 it says the lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love you know god is waiting why is god waiting he is waiting because he is a god who is gracious who is compassionate forgiving rich in love he is waiting for us and when we come to the new testament we see a father waiting in luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32 we we all know this the story of the prodigal son right it is a very familiar story it is a very familiar passage jesus spoke here we see the son who was living with all the blessings and all the freedom in the father's house he is going down to the pitiful ways he shouldn't be going when he asked for the share we know the story i'm not explaining that when when he asked you know the two sons the younger one asked for share can you imagine how much he has grieved the father's heart you know the son is coming and he is he did not work for this money you know it is the father's hard earned money and he worked for it he made the wealth and now the son is coming and asking give me my share he didn't work for it but he is asking to give the share so how much it might have grieved the father's heart and i'm sure the father knew one day this boy will become like a beggar the father knew that this boy is going to destroy it you know because he knew he is a wise man the father knew what is waiting for him as soon as he steps out of the house you know when you when you are in the house when you are comfortable when you are free when you are well fed you don't know the value of all those things only when you get out you know last week we heard about the deceiver and his strategies you know when you step out of the house when you go away when you wander away from the house the deceiver is waiting there the destroyer is waiting there he comes to kill steal and destroy so this father knew what is going to happen he knew that he is going to destroy it still the father allowed him to take his share and go you know god's heart for his children is that we will stay with him in his house in that beautiful presence and protection of the almighty god amen but it is us the children we feel bored when we stay in the house you know many times children they do not want to obey the rules of the house many times the children they do not want to listen to the father when the father punishes when the father scolds they feel bad they feel angry why are you scolding me why are you punishing me why are you asking me to do this work i don't want to do this and the outside world is it is so glamorous you know it is so glittery it is shiny so looking from the house you when you look at the outside world you might think that this is the perfect place for me you know we as children we do that we look outside and we fall for those attractions but you know father knows god knows what we are doing so we know that god has given us a free will right we all have free will even before i go into wrong ways as i said before god knows what i am going to do but the thing is he doesn't stop me as he wants me to choose his way he wants me to choose it is not he forcing me to stay he is not telling me no 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 you can't go you stay here you don't know what is outside there but we he expects us to understand his love to understand his care to know that he is loving us he is doing everything for our good so he is expecting us to choose what is right for us you know this father might have prayed every day every moment of his life you know for the son when he left he might have prayed for the for the son to learn the valuable lessons in life for his eyes of understanding to open up and for him to come back to where 
he rightfully belongs to his house. Thus, the father waited. And in the story, when we read that story of Luke chapter 15, we know what happened to the son. You know, we know the rich man became poor. In verse 14, we see that the, the son, he lost everything. He lost all the money. He misused all the money that he had. And he was in need. He was in need. He needed. He needed bread. He needed money. He needed food. No food. The rich man became a beggar. The free man became a slave in verse 15. You know, he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country. He was free in his father's house. But now because of the need, he has to get a job. He went and hired himself to the citizen of that country. And the fed and satisfied became hungry and starving for a meal. In verse 16, we see that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. At least that food of the pigs, if I could have gotten that food, but no one gave him anything. See what a pathetic situation he is in now. A, po a person going down to the roads, he shouldn't be going. You know, he ends up in deep trouble. Here, no one helped him. No one helped, helped the son. So in verse 17, we see that he came back to his senses. We can say that the prayers of the father is getting answered. And the prodigal son, while he was thinking about it, you know, I need to go back to the father's house. He did not expect anything more than becoming a, like a slave in the father's house. Like a servant, maybe my father will accept me. Like a servant, like a slave. And he was hungry, he realized. My father has something I'm hungry for. You know, I'm here, I, I need food. I don't have anything. But how many people are eating there in my father's house? How many servants? How many slaves? So I had to go back. So today, what are you hungry for? You know, if you're hungry for anything, the father has it. If you're hungry for peace, father has it. If you're, if you're hungry for love, if you're looking for love in wrong places, come back to the father. The father has it. You know, whatever you are hungry for, the father has it. So we see that the son set out, set, his, set out his journey back home. And meanwhile, we know the father was waiting. And I'm sure every day, the father might have gone to the terrace of his house, or he might have climbed on a hill. And somewhere, you know, somewhere where he can see far and wide, where he can look into all those roads, the places around, the, the, the path through which the, the, the son may come back. So he was looking far and wide. And we know when people come to our house, like I said before, like the call, when people come to our house also, if you are expecting anybody, if one person is saying that I will be coming to your house on Tuesday, I'll come at seven o'clock, you will be looking out for that person, right? But otherwise, if you're not expecting anybody, you wouldn't know even, they, they, even though they come to the door and they ring the bell, then only you will come to know that this person is here. Otherwise, you will be looking out. When is that person? When is my guest coming? When is my friend coming? You will be looking out. So here we see that this father was waiting. He was waiting and he was looking every day. He was looking out. He was going into the terrace or wherever he could see from far. He, he was looking around and, and waiting for his son. That is why he could see when the, when the son was coming from far away. So in verse 20, it says, he was filled with compassion and ran to the son. You know, he did not wait for the son to come to the door. The father was so happy. He was so loving and compassionate. And when he saw the son coming from far away, he ran to him. And what did he do? He gave a big hug and kissed him. And can you imagine the smell of his body and garments? After living for so long with the pigs, where was he? He was living with the pigs. Can you imagine the smell of his body? And he was walking for many days through these dusty roads. No shower, no change of clothes. So we can imagine how bad and smelly he was. But the father didn't mind any of those things. He did not worry about, you know, how smelly he is, how bad he is, how filthy his clothes are. And he didn't even wait for an apology from the son. We know that the son has practiced his speech, right? He said, I will go home and I will tell my father, Father, 
I have done wrong. I have sinned against you and heaven. Forgive me. He practiced all that. But the father did not even wait to hear that apology. You know, he, he was least bothered when he delivered his speech. For him, son coming back to his own house was the biggest event. Amen. So he asked the servants to bring the best robe and a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And as I told you, this person, he was very filthy and smelling and bad. And he was not in a state to wear these beautiful clothes. We know that, right? If we were in his place, the father's place, we would ask, go and take a shower first. But here, he did not say anything. He said, he said to the servants, you bring the best robe, bring the ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Why did father put those things on him? There is great meaning in these three things. You know, the first is a robe that is symbolic of a covering. The robe is symbolic of a covering. The Bible says, I am clothed in God's righteousness. I am clothed in God's righteousness. My filth is taken away when he clothed me with his righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10, we read like this. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. What did he cover us with? The robe of righteousness, the garment of salvation. So my wrongs are replaced with his righteousness when he has covered me in that beautiful cloth. You know, my sins are there no more. My filth is there no more. My bad smell is not there. You know, I'm clothed in God's righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5, chapter, verse, chapter 5, verse 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I was a smelly dirty and filthy person, but now I'm clothed in the most expensive, most, most beautiful garment. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. And the next one is a ring. A ring is a sign of authority. In Genesis chapter 41 verse 42, we see when Pharaoh, King Pharaoh, when he appointed Joseph, over his country, and he made him as a second person in the country. We know what he did. He removed his signet ring and placed it on Joseph's finger. So it was showing the authority. King was saying this, today onwards, you have all the power and authority that I have. You know, you can take decisions. You can do things that I will be doing. The same thing you can do. I'm giving you the authority. I'm giving you the power. In the book of Esther, Esther chapter 8, verse 2, again, we see, King took off the signet ring and gave to Mordecai. You know the story of Mordecai, Haman and Mordecai. And Mordecai was honored by the king. And when he honored Mordecai, when he placed in a high position, he gave the ring to Mordecai. So when the father given ring to this son, he was welcoming him back to the position and authority of the house. See, the son wanted to be like a slave. The son wanted to be like a servant. But the father is saying, no, 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 you are not a servant. You are not a slave. You are my son. You have all the authority. You have all the power. I'm giving you the ring. I'm giving you the authority. And you will be the authoritative person like me in this house. So we know when a sinner returns to Jesus, we, are, we, are, we will become the members of heaven, right? We are becoming the member of the kingdom of God. But we are not only becoming members of the kingdom of God, but God gives us authority to rule for him on this earth. You know, we have a certain authority. We can take the name of Jesus, like those king's signet ring. You know, Joseph, Mordecai, they could use that ring to do anything they wanted to do because God has given that authority to them. Just like that, when God has given us his authority, we can act upon that authority. That is why we use the name of Jesus. You know, in the name of Jesus, there is deliverance. In the name of Jesus, there is healing. We can use the name of Jesus and that, that authority that is given to us. Amen. And the third one is a sandal, which is a sign of his joyful acceptance as a son. In the Old Testament, if you study, we know that if you had no shoes or sandals, that was symbolic of mourning. When you're sad, when you're sorrowful, you know, those people, they did not wear sandals or shoes. In 2 Samuel 15, chapter 15, verse 30, when King David, we know the story of King David, running away from his son Absalom, when Absalom turned against David, 
we read here david went weeping with his head covered and walked barefoot he had no shoes he had no sandals because his son was against him he was sorrowful he was running away from the palace he could not wear the sandals and another incident we see in the book of ezekiel ezekiel chapter 24 you can read this portion later on at home here ezekiel's wife died and god said you should not mourn for the dead don't mourn for your wife do not weep in verse 17 ezekiel 24 17 it says do not weep do not take off your shoes do not mourn do not be sorrowful don't take off the shoes so the shoes without shoes it was mourning it was sorrowful so here when the father gave sandals to the son he was proclaiming that it is time to put away the sadness because i was sorrowful all this time you know from the moment the son left the house till he come, came back home he was sorrowful he was mourning for the son he was praying he was wailing he was waiting and now it is over this is the time to rejoice this is the time to be glad let us celebrate so the father said the son is back in the house he was lost but now he is found he was dead now he is alive come let us celebrate he is back now let us celebrate hallelujah and so you may ask me why is god waiting today we have studied from the creation genesis and we have looked at the history of israel and we have seen in the new testament how a father waited and why is god waiting today the first one is to restore my relationship with him god wants to restore my relationship with him we know that god sees each one of us as his sons and daughters even when our clothes are dirty you know even when we are at the lowest point of our life when we are hungry and hopeless he loves us as we are and wants to restore us back to his kingdom you know even when you are walking away from home that son walked away from home but the father's love was not less than when he was at home you know father loved him the same father loves us god loves us the same even when we go into wrong ways he is always waiting there to restore us he wants to clothe you with the robe of righteousness put the ring on your finger saying you have every authority and power as my child and he wants to give sandals for you saying you bring me joy and gladness amen psalms 23 verse 3 it says we sang this morning he restores my soul he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake he restores my soul god wants to restore us back to him he wants to help he wants us to go back to the house to be with him and number 2 is to restore my relationship with my loved ones you know when the prodigal son came back home he came back to not only a relationship with the father but a relationship with the brother and others in the household we know that the brother was very angry in the beginning right he didn't want to celebrate he didn't want to um, kill the kill the bull and celebrate but the father's comforting words father's loving words restored that relationship between the brothers we know that after that he stayed home with his brother and he was loved by everybody in the house and we know that relationships can be difficult and it takes time and effort to make them go strong relationship with others in the family you know with our friends maybe you are struggling with a relationship today he might be having a relationship problem with your husband or wife maybe with your son or daughter your mother or father maybe with your friends you know if you are struggling maybe they have done something wrong to you and you are struggling to forgive you are struggling to forget in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 i like to read this in the message version not an iv this is message version second corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 18 reads like this all this comes from god who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other you know first god has settled our relationship with him him and us if our relationship with our god is right then god will help us to restore the relationship with our loved ones that is to settle a relationship with each other so would you come to jesus this morning would you ask him to help you to restore the relationships in your life god will take away that hurt that pain that unforgiveness to make your hearts renewed and refreshed to make those relationship right 
So we need to pray those specific prayers, you know, in whatever area you need help, wherever you need help from God. We need to pray and ask God, Lord, help me to restore the relationship with my husband, with my children, you know. I'm really struggling. I need your help. And you will be amazed to see God setting you free. You know, God will take away that pain. God will take away that burden from you. And you can be restored in the relationship. And number three is to restore my joy. We know the prodigal son who was not expecting to be accepted as a son. He wanted to be at least like a servant or slave. So when he came back home and when he received such a welcome, you know, with the, with the most beautiful and expensive robe and the ring and the sandals and the celebration, we can imagine the joy that he had. You know, the joy only the father can give. That joy, he wants to restore me into that joy. In Psalms 51 verse 12, we know David's story. When David sinned with Bathsheba, we know the story. When prophet Nathan came to him, in verse 12, it says, David is crying out and asking God to restore him. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You know, he lost the joy when he went into those sinful ways. David lost the joy and he realized that. So he is coming to God's presence with a genuine repentant heart. So this morning, if you have lost that joy, if you have gone into the unwanted ways, if you don't feel the joy of the Lord in your life, come back to God and cry out to him. We know the happiness that we experience from this world. You know, many times we, when we get something from this world, we feel happy. And we don't get it. We don't feel happy. That happiness will be gone and this is momentarily. You know, whatever happiness you get from this world is momentarily. But the true joy comes from within, from our connection with our joy giver, our God. So the joy that God gives cannot be taken away with circumstances. The joy that God gives it cannot be taken away, even if we lack anything, even if we don't get it. You know, you wish for something and you didn't get it. The joy cannot be taken away from your life, from your heart. That is the joy that God gives. And number four, to hear me speak to him. And we know that the prodigal son, he, he practiced his speech. And he felt so undeserved and unworthy to speak to the father. Still, he practiced the speech and somehow he delivered it, right? So sometimes we also feel so unworthy, undeserving to come to God's presence. You know, when you have gone into wrong things, when you have done something that is not God's will, many times we feel that I don't deserve to be in God's presence. I feel really bad. I don't even feel like praying. But we need to remember that those are the times of your greatest need to speak to him. So it is very important to pray when you're struggling. It is very important to pray, even when you don't feel like praying. Just open your mouth and ask God, because in Isaiah 30 verse 18, it says, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. The Lord is waiting there. He wants to help you. You know, only if we open our hearts, we open our mouths and ask the Lord, Father, I need your help. I need your guidance. Help me, deliver me. Maybe he's waiting there to deliver you from that addiction that you have. Maybe he is waiting there to restore that relationship with your loved ones. Maybe he is waiting to restore your health. Maybe you are, you are, you are praying for healing in your body from some sickness. And God is waiting to give you that. God will give you the breakthrough, whatever it is in your life. And God is waiting to fill you with the Holy Spirit if you ask him. Amen. And God loves to hear his children speak to him always, you know. Fathers love when their children, when his children speak to them. And saying that, Daddy, I love you. I'm so grateful for everything you have done in my life, all the blessings that I'm receiving from you. I'm so grateful. So spend time with God every day. Speak to him, even when you don't feel like praying. Pray and spend time and give your burdens, your concerns. And... Open your heart before God. Amen. And number five, to hear me say yes to him. God is waiting to hear me say yes to him. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, Isaiah heard the Lord asking him, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah replied to, to this. He replied to God and said, Here am I, send me. Lord, here am I. I'm willing. I'm willing to listen to you. 
if you want to send me you send me so we know that there are so many prodigal sons wandering away from home you know so many prodigals out in the world you know your friend circle where you work or study or the people outside you know you step out of this building you can see so many wandering around they are hopeless they are helpless they do not know this good news that the father is waiting so who can help them only us who experience the love of god we are staying in his house right we are staying in the father's house so we can take we can share this good news to these people and say that there is a father you know he is waiting for you he loves you he cares for you come back to him come back to him he wants to restore your life and he wants to use you know father wants to use you and me to share this gospel so will you say yes to jesus lord i am here like ishaya said here i am send me lord i want to go to my friends i want to go to my neighborhood i want to go wherever you send me i will go and do your work so friends our father is waiting you know he is not waiting to punish us he is not waiting to destroy us he doesn't want to see us living in sin he doesn't want to see us living in the pit he is waiting to restore us he is waiting to restore the joy of that salvation in our lives he is waiting to you clothe you with the robe of righteousness he is waiting there to hug you to give you a big hug and kiss and say that i love you you know father is waiting there and he wants you to have the fullness of everything he says in his word all the blessings that he has said there for his children the father wants to receive you not as a slave not as a servant but as a son as a member of the family to have all the authority and power as his children 